growing weary of running from room to room, practicing one-tooth insurance-driven dentistry? Then stay tuned for the latest episode of The Lionhearted, where Dr. Stephen Rasner will hand you the blueprint for what many call the gold standard of general practice dentistry. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Steve Rasner. Welcome back to The Lionhearted. Today, I want to talk about two basic things. One is... Let's get back to boosting your case acceptance, to making it palpably more toward yes than you've experienced in a long time, and how we can take that same moment and use it as an opportunity to increase the trust between you and that patient. Why don't you think about that for a second? You have a patient in front of you that in many cases you just met. At some time, often in the first hour of meeting them or maybe a second visit, you are asking them to invest in your organization, you, in their oral health. That's a lot going on there. And if you follow my model, we're talking about a comprehensive treatment planning approach, which very often they've never experienced before. So the net result of that to attain higher levels of oral health is that they'll have to reach into their pocket for the first time and go beyond the insurance-driven treatment plans that they've been given many times their whole career prior to you. That's a big deal. Yet I'm telling you, at the same time, if you do it correctly, it's an opportunity to increase trust because I am not here today to tell you how to sell somebody. I am not here today to tell you how to talk somebody into something with some fancy language that somebody has given you or fancy techniques. Say, I don't believe in sales techniques for uh, oral health care. I don't. I believe you should optimize the situation to get them to understand the value of what you're going to be able to deliver to them. And not everybody knows that. I think you should optimize the moment that you're with them by looking good, looking clean, looking presentable, kind of unlike I do now with my four-day beard. But a lot of you guys can get away with that. I probably can't. But really, I'm not kidding. Having, your, having you looking, looking physically immaculate, Walt Disney clean as you, as you will. Because people do make judgments about you in tenths of a second. And if that judgment, which is not the focus of this podcast, is that you're unkept to any degree, you've got a very big negative to overcome already. So the first part of this podcast, actually the second part, is going to be about getting back to case acceptance and how you can use that to facilitate trust in a patient. Because very often, they're not gonna say yes with the model I'll give you if, if the circumstances aren't, aren't right. And that's fine. Because here's the thing, here's why it's fine. If all of you would just try for the next three months to adopt a comprehensive approach to deciding what your patients need. And I'll go into that in a few minutes. That's very different than a lot of what these patients have experienced prior to you. And if you did that with, by being earnest, not going into the room to try to create these giant treatment plans for a patient that doesn't have that value or for a patient that doesn't have the means to do that. That doesn't mean you shouldn't present that. You should never look at a patient and just presume that they can't afford or, or don't want that type of care just by looking at them. You should have a firm protocol that that's how you present your, that's how that it was your approach to case presentation, which I'm gonna go over. I'm just saying, if you do it the way, the style I'll impart today on this podcast, you often have people 
they don't do the treatment, but they trust you. So let's get back to that. I want to start with one other thing. I want to start briefly with something I don't think I've ever said to you. And that's a way to help you sustain success. And I believe that you will never achieve, achieve peak success in dentistry by yourself. And I'm not talking about your staff at this point. I'm talking about your inner professional circle. I'm not, don't blow this off. I really want you to think about this. I want you to think about who is surrounding you that can advise you. So let me break it down a little bit. And you can assume that 99% of the advice I've ever given you on these podcasts came from me either making the mistake I shared and wanted you to correct on your end or from just learning a better way to do things. So, you know, I've never come on these podcasts and said how easy this is. Quite the opposite. I think dentistry, especially in the last 12 years, since, you know, 2005, 2008, has become way more difficult to achieve the type of daily practice that you once had and even a personal life to go with it because let's just be honest, it's harder. Insurance companies became toxic and made it very difficult to feel rewarded or want to do the type of work that those of us that have been out there for so long had, had been used to. You know, when somebody cuts your fees by 30 to 35, 40%, it has a toll. It absolutely does. It changes everything. You know, I think patients have gotten more fickle than they used to be. You know, I mean, corporate dentistry wasn't what it wasn't what it is today in 2005 for sure. And I'm not anti-corporate dentistry except that it doesn't align with my values. Um, and I'm sure there's many corporations. I mean, I can't be familiar with everyone that probably ascribe to similar values that I have. But in general, for me on this ride, it doesn't make it easier. So here's my point. You want to achieve the various high, highest levels of success. And in this, this information I'm giving you comes, it's not unique to dentistry for sure. I would consider a professional life coach. I'm not kidding. I don't care what state you're in or what country you're in. Google professional life coaches. See if you can meet with one once or twice. Just, I have this rule in life. I call it the 120-day rule. Here's what it means. I don't have many things that I invented. I think that's one of them. It means if you hear an idea that sounds cogent to you and you're positive it can't destroy you, you know, I'm not asking you to sign a contract for 20000 with the life coach. I wouldn't do that. But I'm telling you, what about if you just tried it? This idea that you may never have thought of until this particular day that you're listening to me. And you try it. And it makes a difference. Like you have somebody that you can bounce ideas off of. That they may, they're not going to be a dentist. They're just going to be a professional life coach that coach many different professional occupations. And they usually coach people who are very driven to achieve higher levels. So they're used to helping you make decisions better than your significant other can or better than somebody not informed. I, I advocate that you consider that. Number two, believe it or not, there are, in my opinion, and I've lectured and I've presented to conventions of accountants before, and an accountant is not an accountant is not an accountant. You should Google accountants, whether they're in your area or not. This is a beautiful thing because you don't have to, they don't have to be within 20 minutes of you. They could be in different states, but there are accounting firms out there that specialize in helping us dentists. And I would again highly encourage you to at least seek that out. Maybe you're really 
not catching the breaks as a professional that you're supposed to be catching. Maybe you're making a lot of bad decisions or are about to make a bad decision based on the lack of the type of accountant that I want you to have in your back pocket. And while we're at it, and this is going to sound like a giant leap to you, I would even encourage those of you that can afford it, not maybe not those of you that are right out of school, but those of you that are settling in now to a nice career, you know, I don't know what that translates into money. I would consider having an attorney as a retainer to help guide you along your career. I did it for many, many years until my guy retired. And I'm being honest, I haven't renewed and found anybody else in probably the last seven years. And I'm looking right now. Here's what you want. You want things happen in a career. A patient's going to turn on you. I guarantee it is going to happen. And a staff member may not turn on you, but may put you in a situation that you don't know what to do. That's going to happen. Um, advertising could create conflicts with your state board of dentistry. Wouldn't it be better uh, uh, that you, you know, had somebody not at the last second because you're in a panic, but on board. So I would look into dentist, I mean, excuse me, um, counsel that represents dentist. It might be a former attorney that was a prosecutor against dentist in your state. I had that for years. It's exactly what I had. And anything, if I had a, a question about advertising in my state or staff problems, uh, do I have to do this or that with a staff member? Um, th again, these are little things, but I would highly encourage you to consider it. So a life coach, an accountant, possibly an attorney. Do these cost money? Absolutely. Is it worth it for those of you that are on a direction to a special place in terms of achievement in dentistry? You'll get there a lot quicker and with less problems with a team than without a team. Uh, and certainly a financial advisor as well. Um, and even, even a, a, the rep that represents you, that sells you supplies, you need somebody that's not there just to sell you supplies. You need somebody that knows, that knows the scene, that knows when you're looking for a part-time associate. That sales rep could be of service possibly to you. Or maybe you want to hire a part-time endodontist or a part-time periodontist. A sales rep is not a sales rep is not a sales rep. So that's my spiel on creating a, um, an inner circle. So let me now turn back to what I started the, this podcast with, and that was upping your case acceptance. How can we do that? And yes, I have five different podcast, I believe, on case acceptance. And they're probably the most viewed of all the ones I've done, but I don't think you can ever stop talking about it because I don't think of it, there's anything else that happens, that, a skill that you own or a protocol that you provide in being a dentist that has more impact on what people say to you after you present what you think they should have done. What could? If you don't have that skill, you're going to do what a lot of your colleagues do, and that's one-tooth dentistry in an insurance-driven practice. And that's not a good place to live, and that's not a good return on what you invested at least eight years of college in. So, yes, I've talked about it before, but I want to take you back for a minute. Um, I want to take you back to the very beginning, of which I'm going to go over really quickly, because... There's more of that in earlier podcasts, but I want to bring you some new stuff that I've developed just recently. Just remember, when that patient has arrived in my office, and hopefully you'll adopt this, they have been screened by a new patient coordinator to be able to give me information, and I know when they get to my office that they're not going to say, I can't take radiographs. That's not going to happen because we covered that in the screen. I know that I can do a full examination and they're not going to 
want me just to look at the one tooth because they had the ability to, ex to not come in when that was covered at the screen with a new patient phone call. So go back and visit that if you need to. But by the time they get to me, they're not going to say the things I just alluded to. And that has happened to me in my career. And it is not only a waste of time, it is a downer for everyone. So bottom line, bottom takeaway is, is if they're not going to let me do whatever x-rays I need, whatever models I need to give them a full diagnosis, then they're not coming into my office. And there's ways to say that very proactively and, and not offend people or chase them away. So a good example of that is you keep hearing me talk about my comprehensive approach to patients. Well, I certainly don't walk into a patient and say to the patient, um, well, listen, today I'm going to do a comprehensive exam on you because that's the best way to examine you. Comprehensive sounds expensive, almost sounds scary. So this is what I say, and this is what I would advocate you do. I would begin, now remember, you, at this point they've already had x-rays. There's probably a significant other, if they indicated need, sitting in a chair next to them. They are brought back into the room after the radiographs are done, after the charting's done, which by the way is done by a real positive energy, talented hygienist or dental assistant. You want somebody that can just breeze through this, you know, 10 minute period, uh, not choke them to death on the x-rays or just be somebody that can't talk freely to people they don't know. You want somebody really good good people skills, good clinical skills for this 10 minutes. Of course you do. And I say that to you because I'm sure there were years in my practice that I considered that part of the day that I could give that skill to my new dental assistant I was just that's only been here for three weeks. I wouldn't dream of doing that today. Um, that goes to somebody that I really have a lot of faith, trust, experience with. Okay, I walk into the room, we do small talk. It is an oh, by the way, good old boy approach by me. Um, partly because that's the way I am. And partly because I think that's a good way to be. You know, so it's like, hey, you guys, I'm Doc Rasner. How'd you guys find me? Just like that. And um, I can assure you, uh, I've taken a few minutes to brush my teeth, make my hair look reasonable, make sure I don't have emperor gum on my chin or a cherry tomato on my loops from lunch, which I've done all those things before. And I walk in and I'll tell them I've, you know, I usually say, most people that know me already know that this is my whole life. That I'm a guy that has never golfed. I'm not telling you to say that, but I, it's a nice line by the way, if you haven't done that. I tell them, I don't own a boat. I said, they're probably great things. They're probably great things to do. But my whole life's dentistry has been, and you don't you only have so many hours in a day. So they're picking up on my passion or whatever that is appropriate for you in seconds. I said, I've learned a lot in my career, but what I've learned the most is something that I call what to do when. I said, I, and I say, I want you to think about that for a minute. What to do when? Like, we just met. Sometime in this meeting, I'm going to tell you what I recommend that you do, assuming I can do that today and do not need further models or tests. So how do you know? How would you know that that's the right advice? And equally important, how do I know that's the right advice? I say, I'll tell you what I do. I look at five things on everyone and it keeps me in the straight and narrow. That's how I talk. And people like that. That is, that resonates to most patients. Even at this point. You know, maybe it's just the fact that I'm talking to them that resonates to them. And they're not used to that. I mean, I've heard horror stories of dentists walking in and, you know, we don't all have the same people skills. 
And that is something you can work on. If it was me and I didn't have those skills, I'd go on YouTube. I've never done it to look up improving my people skills, eye contact, whatever it is, but that's what I would do. This is too important to say, oh, I can't do that. Heck no. So I say to them, I'm gonna look at five things. Now, as I'm saying it to them, the x-rays are right in front of them on a TV screen. I'll say, first, I'm gonna look at the health of your teeth. And again, I'm not gonna do the detail with you right now because um, I have provided that in an earlier podcast. Then I tell them I'm gonna look at the health of, excuse me, I look at the health of their gums first, the health of their teeth, their missing teeth, their joints and their muscles, and lastly, their aesthetics. So that you can go back to earlier podcasts and see what I say about that. But that's how I tell them I'm going to do a comprehensive exam. Okay. But now I want to elaborate on some key moments because I told you that this podcast is about getting to yes, some caveats I've never brought up before, and also um, getting to yes and, and creating trust in my recommendations in the same activity. It's weird if you think about it because I'm there creating a reason for them to make what many of them have never made before, an investment that's going to be out of pocket. Many of your patients have never done that to a significant degree. And although that's not my goal, I know it's a fact that that's what's going to happen. Because if you look at 10 patients comprehensively and look at the five areas I just gave you, Eight of them are going to need something. Okay. So when I'm talking about their periodontium, and I told you I look at their gums first, I, that is a perfect opportunity for you to draw the line in the sand. See, I don't think there's any room for compromise on that. I don't think you should G scale, gingivitisly scale at through one, I mean two visits, a patient that needs periodontal scaling and root planning because you want to make it easier for the patient. It's either yes or no. And it's an area for me that over my career and years, I have drawn the line in the sand because I know, and a lot of my colleagues listening know, knows, that that often determines the longevity of the work you provide. So you could be capable of having amazing hands and doing amazing vertical preps or butt joint buckle preps and, or whatever you subscribe to and use a wonderful dental lab as well that understands the nuances of microns when it comes to fit. But if they don't have good hygiene and you don't institute the philosophy that that is critical. So a good example is any patient that comes to me, and I didn't used to say these things, that this getting scaled and root planing, I tell them right at this visit, let me tell you something, I've learned a lot, and I talk like that, in the years I've been doing this dentisting stuff. I don't know if I say that or not. And one thing I know is this, you need to know right now something black and white. If you're gonna believe in me, if you're going to believe in my philosophy, which is to make you as healthy as you can possibly be in your oral cavity, then you're going, and, and I tell you, you need to come in here for, you know, two to four visits to have what you call a deep cleaning. You're going to have to come in here either every three months or four months, and guess what? For the rest of your life. And your insurance is not going to pay that, which means that you'll be spending whatever that is, I don't know what it is in your office, let's say it's $120 twice a year beyond your dental insurance examinations that are covered to have to maintain what we do. And I got to tell you something, I don't hesitate for a second to say that to you. I'll tell you why. Because if you add up once or twice a year that fee times the next 20 years versus needing implants or periodontal surgery or laser therapy or all the things that we dentists use to control advanced periodontal problems, 
It's not even close, let alone going through the process. The price of it is, a, is way in your benefit if you never have to go through that. And I believe that 120%. So it's easy to communicate that. So that's number one. Number two, let's talk for a minute when I talk about the joint and muscle exam. Yes, I do a joint and muscle exam. No, I don't make that a big part of my practice. Now you're talking to a, a clinician that once kept a Doppler in, on my belt as part of my examinations. That's how into the, moit, the joint and muscle part of the examinations I was. Here's what I'll tell you. You got, a, you got one career and you got to spend your time doing what you want to do. I feel there's about 350 of you that end up downloading these podcasts you know, around the, the world. Most of you are in the United States and Canada. You got eight hours a day to do what you got to do. So I'm only giving you one clinician's opinion. It's not rewarding enough to me. It's not enough of return on investment to me. So if I have patients that have joint and muscle pain of significance in the examination, that becomes evident, I'll probably refer them. You know, it's just, so that's my part of the one five, of the five parts of the exam. Now, that being said, I certainly have treated people with substantial power function that don't elicit um, substantial symptoms of hot joints and muscles, even though they have extreme wear. Those patients I'll treat, and I'll treat them, and, and that is in part of my residency recommendations to you, if you go back to that podcast, or just write to me, of where I would train and, uh, and learn the protocols for treating um, parafunctional habits. What about missing teeth? Because I told you the five things are perio, treatment of teeth with pathology, missing teeth, joints and muscles, and aesthetics. Well, here's what I'll tell you about missing teeth. If they've been missing a tooth and it's only one, and it's been like that for over by your eyes, five to 10 years or more, and they haven't mentioned that as an issue, I would walk on very delicate ice when talking about it. I just get too many patients referred to me by a young dentist that recommended an implant, by the way, often not mentioning the need for a bone graft, in an area of the mouth that is missing a tooth. So I also don't want the patients, I had, I had patients that have been missing all of their molars and function totally ad adequately without them. So that will be my question. You know, now, obviously, if they're about to lose a number of teeth because you're treating them and they haven't been treated for, the, for many years, it's much easier to talk about tooth replacement. So I am telling you, in my opinion, now, I am not including that, I'm not including the scenarios where somebody is showing um, symptoms of posterior bite collapse and have splayed anterior teeth because of the momentum of forces have changed in their mouth. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, an asymptomatic patient sitting in front of you. I wouldn't, my first thought wouldn't be, um, when I say asymptomatic, asymptomatic relative to their missing teeth. My first thought wouldn't be, I got to get teeth back there. You know, give them a chance to bond and trust with you. And then aesthetics is another opportunity to not come on too strong. So I always say this about the aesthetics, because remember, this conversation is occurring by me saying, I'm going to look at five things on you, the health of your gums, all of your teeth, your missing teeth, etc. And then the last thing I'm going to look at is your aesthetics. And that to me is an always up to you thing. I mean, meaning that, you know, if you're okay with your aesthetics, I'm okay with your aesthetics. Now, I got to tell you, that's my initial approach. And that doesn't sound 
ultra aggressive to me. That doesn't sound like, oh my God, I gotta be worried about this guy. You know, I think that's a very, very safe way to approach a new patient. And lots of those patients, incidentally, end up with having aesthetic dentistry done if everything else is copacetic. So, you know, that being said, I will say this. Number one, if they mentioned on the new patient interview that we do over the phone and we do it again in our office on a lesser scale because people lie over the telephone and you get a more accurate barometer of where they're at if you take a couple more minutes and do the in-office interview, which is kind of a Cliff Notes version of what you did on the phone. But if they mentioned the aesthetic, like well, they don't love their front teeth, Part of my initial documentation, x-rays, charting, et cetera, will be not making a big deal about it, having my dental assistant take a photograph of your patient, facial, left, and right. That's it. Why do you do that? You want an interesting tidbit? Your patient sitting in front of you has never seen their face as well as you see their face because humans can't look at their face unless it's in a mirror or in pictures. So a lot of patients don't know what they look like from the side. You know, when you smile for a regular photograph, you're not posing to show uh, an upper right first bicuspid that looks black or bl blackish because it has an old amalgam in it. So, or missing number uh, second bicuspid or a first molar, that they're not even really cognizant that the world can see that. So it is a good technique to use. Um, often I'll present to them, so when I'm doing the examination, you know, after the documentation has been gathered, part of that is three photographs. And it's low keyed. I want you to know that. You know, sometimes we'll mock them up. Sometimes they'll bring them back and mock them up. I try to, you know, let me make this clear. I try to do everything I can do in that initial visit to make a decision. If I think I could stand in front of a board of dentistry or in front of colleagues and defend my recommendations, they're getting a treatment plan on day one. End of story. Now, I do a lot of surgery, so naturally that is just impossible. I have to have CT scans, which I have in my office, I have to read the CTs, uh, do wax mock-ups sometimes. I need to know if there's a sinus left involved and you know bone grafting, et cetera. So um, we'll come back to that. Uh, you know, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm gonna make this a part one and part two because I can see I'm at just about 30 minutes already. Sorry that happened. So if you're watching this podcast, there will positively be a part two to it on getting back to case acceptance and getting your patients to trust you in the same breath. Um, and I'll leave with a couple points about that. We're skipping ahead because I'm not done talking about the elements that should happen during examination that do create trust. You know, what analogies? So I'll, give you a good, I'll give you one more. So say your patient's in front of you and your x-rays are up and it's clear in the x-rays that they're uh, on just about any patient you see that's an adult, it will not be unusual to be a root canal, a missing tooth, uh, or a crown, correct? So one of the things I say in my pre-examination is when I first said I'm going to look at your health of your periodontium, I tell them they're gums. I said, then I'm going to look at all your teeth. Now, that's not something patients often hear from their dentist. I'm going to look at all your teeth. Well, right when I'm about to do that, I say to the patient, you know, the reason I look at all your teeth is exemplified right in these x-rays that we took on you a few minutes ago. Look, you had a root canal done and a cap on the upper right. Do you remember having that done? And you got a missing tooth on the lower left. And you have a crown on the upper right without a root canal. What if I or another dentist 
had examined those teeth early, early on in the process. You know what? You'd have that tooth right now that you're missing and you wouldn't need the root canal and, and possibly the crown as well. So clearly the best way is for, the best way for you is a philosophy that I call less is best. If I can fix a tooth with a filling, and yes, I say that, if I can fix a tooth. If I can fix a tooth with a filling, okay, if it was a professor, which I don't get a lot of professors, or a doctor, I'd say, if I can restore the tooth. But for the bulk of my patients, they like fix a tooth. If I can do that with a filling and not a crown, that's less. If I have to use a crown, but I don't need a root canal, that's less. And certainly if I can keep the tooth, it's less and it's better for you. Less is best. And that comes from doing what we're doing right now, a full exam. Hey, I love talking about this with you guys and I, I hope it resonates and I hope you enjoy it. Tune in next week and I'm gonna do part two of this. Um, remember, you can reach me at Dr. Rasner at AOL, D-R, my last name, R-A-S-N-E-R -E at AOL. And you can see where I'm speaking and check out my courses, including my surger, surgery course, which is in October 4th and 5th of 2019 in my office in Vineland, New Jersey. And that would be at rasnerinstitute.com. Hey guys, appreciate your listening to me and I'll see you soon at the Lionhearted. Thanks.